Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can manage your .NET application configuration in a very nice, elegant and scalable way. This video is sponsored by AWS and I will be using an AWS specific service in this video. However, the free tier for this service is so generous, you're probably never going to have to pay for it. So this applies for everyone, no matter your cloud option. Because this video is sponsored, all the code I'm going to show in this video can be found in the links down below. Well, without any further ado, let's go straight into the video. If you like the above content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe by ringing the notification bell. And for more training, check out nickchapsters.com. So let me show you what I have here. I have a simple API here with two controllers. One is just the weather forecast controller, basic stuff. And the other one is an example controller, which is doing a very specific thing. In here, I'm injecting two things. First, I'm injecting an iConfiguration object, and this interface is actually by default registered in .NET. And the other one is the iOptions, and then I'm using an example settings object here. And this object here just has one property, the connection string. If we go into the app settings.json, you can actually see that this object maps to this section in my app settings.json. We are doing that by going in the program.cs or the startup.cs, depending on which version you're using. And then using the configure method in the service collection, we're mapping that to an object and then we are getting the section from the configuration. It has been like this since forever. It's a very fundamental part of .NET. Uh, and as you can see, we have two different types of app settings here. We have a development one and an app settings one. The way this works by default, and you can actually customize it, but by default, um, .NET will actually load this app settings.json in every scenario. And then if you use an environment specific app settings file, for example, this one that includes development in the title, then the way this works is it will actually just override any value that app settings.json also has. So for example, if we have this log level as the default being information in that app settings.json, then the app settings.development.json, if I had warning here or debug, for example, it would override that other value. So it's like an overriding mechanism. And this environment uh, name is actually coming from the um, environment variables. So ASP.NET Core underscore environment. Here it is production. So the way this will work is the development file will be ignored. So only this one will be loaded. I'm just giving you a bit of a background here. So if I go ahead and I run this API now, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to call this examples controller. So I'm going to go in Postman and hit the endpoint. And as you can see, I'm getting the same value both from the object and from the config. The way this works in this scenario is I'm either injecting that object and then I'm getting its value from the iOptions interface with that generic type, which by default, the configure method will do for me or I'm using the raw I configuration interface, which allows me to get a value, map it to a generic type parameter, and then use the delimiter structure here where you have a, a semicolon or double underscore, both of those work to go deep and say, hey, start from example settings. So this is how you read this. Example settings is the top level. And then to get this value, you need to go deeper and you need to say, connection string here after the semicolon. And that's why this is returning the value. And this is fine. However, imagine that your application is running and you need to change some value during runtime. Well, you can't because what you'd probably do is either update the value and redeploy, or if it is loaded by environment variables, you're going to have to update the environment variable and then restart the application for this to be picked up. However, with the service I'm going to use now and the SDK that Amazon provides, it's going to trivialize the whole thing. It's so, so simple. Let me show you. Let's say I want to have this value in production loaded remotely from a centralized parameter store. How do I do that? Well, in our case, I'm going to go to the AWS console and I'm going to search up here for the systems manager. If you want to try this, it's absolutely free. I have a link in the description for that. So all I need to do is I'm going to go here and click parameter store. There's other interesting stuff here, which we might talk about in the future. But for now, let's just go in the parameter store. And now this parameter store allows me to create parameters that my application can load during startup. So I can go ahead and I can say create parameter. And now this expects a path from me. Now the path is ultimately up to you. But let's imagine that we're using the same AWS account for all our environments. Well, it might be wise to have the environment as part of the parameter name. So you might say for slash production here, and then you might want to have your service name. In our case, it's the weather 
API. And now with all that done, you can actually add the parameter names and the structure. In our case, what we want, if we go back here is example settings uh, and then semicolon connection string. So I can take that and I can just paste it here. And semicolon isn't an acceptable symbol here. So we're gonna delete that and instead use OS slash. And this will automatically be mapped by the SDK for us. So the structure now, instead of being semicolon is for slash. And then I can go ahead and as you can see, I can even have a secure string, which is using a KMS key to encrypt this thing in my account. So it is super secure. If you have like an API key or some sensitive connection string that you want to have in our case, we don't. So we're going to go with simple string, but you can, if you want to, and I'm just going to go ahead and add the, just a URL here. So I'm going to create that parameter and now look how easy it is to integrate with this in our .NET code. All I need to do is go to NuGet and I'm going to search for Amazon.extensions.configuration.systemsmanager and I'm going to add that NuGet package. And now with that added, I can go to the program.cs or startup.cs if you're in an old version of .NET. And all I need to do is say builder.configuration.addSystemsManager. And now I need to point to a path. The path for me is actually the first two things we set in our parameter store. And it just guides the SDK to say, load any parameter that starts with this string. So in our case, let's go back to the console and see, we have the production part and the weather API thing. We need to load anything that starts with that. So you don't load parameters from development, let's say, or from staging or from a different application because this is all top level. So with that copied, if I was just to paste this, it would look something like this. However, it is wise to get this production value from the actual environment. So the way to do that is say environment equals builder dot environment dot environment name. And then we're going to say to lower. Um, and I'm going to just slap that here with string interpolation and that's it. And you can also load the service name from some parameter if you want to. In our case, we're just going to have it here. So now with just that thing done, I can debug this code and watch what happens. Remember in our settings, this value is this. So if I go on Postman and I call it, now it is loading the one from parameter store. Now you might be wondering, hey Nick, how are you calling that AWS service you didn't authenticate? That's true, but my machine here is actually authenticated against AWS, so I didn't need to. If you needed to, you can totally go here and create a new AWS options object, and you can specify credentials, region, everything you need to connect here. And even better, you should actually just make an IAM role and not only limit the service to be able to access parameter store, but you can also use a wildcard in the role to only allow access to parameters starting with this prefix. So in our case, it would be um, this in the, in the role itself. I'm not going to dive too deep into the security aspect because it can get a bit tricky, uh, but fundamentally this would be enough. Now that is cool and all, but if I just debug the application, yes, I am loading for every single of my weather API instances from a single location. But if I just go here and I call this, it's getting that value. If I go to the console and I just click on that and edit it. And by the way, this editing part doesn't have to be manual. You can actually automate this with a million different tools, but let's just assume uh, that this is manual. Now, if I update this now, and this is 8,000, well, if I call this, it didn't really change still the same thing. So where's the value? Well, the value is that you can actually configure it to reload during runtime. So when you change something, it can actually load it without you restarting the application. Now you might be thinking that this will be a complicated thing. Well, comma, timestamp from seconds, and let's just say five seconds. You don't want to have a short time span here. You want to have a bigger one, but for demo purposes, just so I don't wait a minute uh, or five minutes, I'm just going to say five seconds and that's it. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to debug it. And if I just call this endpoint now, we're loading that value. And if I go to the console and I click to update the value, as you can see here, save, and I can go back to Postman, call that. And within five seconds, the from config one is changed. Awesome. Now you might be thinking, hey, the from object one didn't change. Let's remember which one is the from object. The from object, let me just click here, is the one that is injecting the I options, which is most likely what you are injecting in your applications right now or maybe you're just registering this object straight into your DI container, which I would advise against in general, and you're going to see why. So 
the i configuration is getting updated but the object once configured isn't getting updated we don't want that because it's very rare you're actually going to just be using the raw i configuration in your application you're just going to be mapping to an object how can we fix that well here's where it gets interesting if you don't know about the two interfaces i'm going to talk about now so let's add two more settings here i'm not going to name them now all i'm going to do is i'm going to say let's inject the i options monitor of example settings so this is the options monitor and the i options snapshot of example settings and this is the options snapshot and let's go ahead and rename these here we go so all i need to do now is just map them here so settings here this oh i need to change this to s and then this one over here and for the values to be loaded i need to say options monitor dot current value and then options snapshot dot value and now let me just change this a bit and not say from object but say from option then from option monitor and then from option snapshot and they all work differently and you should know about them because they can actually be viable in other situations as well so now we're loading them from three different sources let's run this again and see how it reacts so i'm going to run the api I'm going to go here, I'm going to call it, and as you can see, they all load the exact same value. But now if I go to the console and I change it, if I click on that and I update it, here we go, and I save, and I go back to Postman and call it. Now, the three bottom ones were updated, but the option one wasn't updated. Why is that? Well, that's because the I options, the I options monitor and the I options snapshot, they all do three fundamentally different things. The I options is effectively a singleton. So once registered, its value won't change, even if the provider behind the scenes is changing the parameters of the I configuration. The I options monitor is effectively transient. Well, its value is transient. The actual I options monitor interface is a singleton, but it will always return the latest value, the current value. Meaning that within a request, if let's say you have an API request and you have like middleware, then in that middleware, because the whole thing is scoped, you might actually resolve the value with a pre-change value, then the provider changes, and then the rest of the request is using the other value. And this can lead in some horrendous scenarios where you start the request with one setting and you end it with another setting. And this can be a no-no. So if you're using monitor, know that its value will change within a scope. But the value of the I options snapshot is actually scoped, meaning that if you start a request and you resolve the value and it is X, and then the value is updated in the provider, but you're still within the same request, anytime you resolve this value within that request, it will have that same previous value. And it's only gonna get updated in the new request within that scope. This is very useful stuff, even if you're not using that AWS provider. But in this case, the provider does it for us and allows us to use the latest value in any scenario we need. And it was so, so easy to set up. And it's actually surprisingly configurable. You can actually have many of those, right? You can load, let's say, from another shared um, parameter store prefix that you might have. It's very common to actually have shared like cross company values and you might have them look like this. Now, this isn't the only way you can actually do this. You can remove this and you can say systems parameter configuration source. And in that source, you can specify source.path. And this would be, in this case, your path. And you can specify a bunch of other things too. For example, filters. You can say if it's optional or not. You can have a prefix. You can have options for configuration. You can even have a parameter processor. And actually, AWS is using a customized parameter processor because if you remember here, it is using forward slash to separate the structure of the parameter. However, forward slash isn't a configuration delimiter in .NET semicolon and double underscore is. How do they deal with that? Well, the way they deal with this is with this default parameter processor. If you go in here, you can see that they read the key, they get the key from AWS, from the service, and they check, hey, trim the starting for slash, and then for any other for slash within the actual key, use the key delimiter, which is the configuration path dot key delimiter, which is semicolon. So that's how they deal with the configuration. And that's why it works. It's very, very nicely done and nicely written. And it just makes it so, so easy to have a centralized place with up to 10,000 different configurations for your application to be loaded straight from one location. It's good stuff. 
As always, you can use the link in the description to get both the source and actually try this out for yourself. It's good stuff. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find a link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe, not to like this, and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.